you've been critical on panpsychism. <laughs> yes, you've noticed that, right. Can you make the case for panpsychism and against it? So panpsychism is the idea that consciousness permeates all matter. It's maybe it, it's uh, the fu fundamental force or it, uh, of physics of the way of the fabric of the universe. Panpsychism, thought everywhere, consciousness mm -hmm. everywhere, right? It, it's one. Uh, it's one. <laughs> it's to a point of entertainment. <laughs> the idea of frustrates you, <laughs> <laughs> which sort of as a fan is is wonderful to watch. And you've had uh, great episodes with with uh, panpsychists. That's right. your podcast where you go at it. I had David Chalmers, who's you know one of the world's great philosophers, and he is he is panpsychism curious. Yeah, you know? he's not. He doesn't commit to anything, but he's certainly willing to entertain it. Philip Goff, who yeah. I've had, and who's a great guy, but he is devoted to panpsychism. Mm -hmm. In fact, he is almost single handedly responsible for the upsurge of interest in panpsychism in the popular imagination. And the argument for it is supposed to be that there is something fundamentally uncapturable about conscious awareness by physical behavior of atoms and molecules. So the panpsychist will say, look, you can tell me maybe someday through advances of neuroscience and what have you, exactly what happens in your brain and how that translates into thought and speech and action. What you can't tell me is what it is like to be me. You can't tell me what I am experiencing when I see something that is red or that I taste something that is sweet. You can tell me what neurons fire, but you can't tell me what I'm experiencing. That first person inner subjective experience is simply not capturable by physics. And therefore, this is an old argument, of course, but then the therefore is supposed to be, I need something that is not contained within physics to account for that. And I'm just gonna call it mind, we don't know what it is yet. We're going to call it mind, and it has to be separate from physics. And then there's two ways to go. If you if you if you buy that much, you can either say, okay, I'm going to be a dualist. I'm going to believe that there's matter and mind, and they are separate from each other, and they are interacting somehow. Or that's a little bit complicated and sketchy as far as physics is going to go. So I'm going to believe in mind, but I'm going to put it prior to matter. I'm going to believe that mind comes first and that consciousness is the fundamental aspect of reality and everything else, including matter and physics, comes from it. That would be at least as simple as physics comes first, right? Now, the physicalist, such as myself, will say, I don't have any problem explaining what it's like to be you or what you experience when you see red. It's a certain way of talking about the atoms and the neurons, et cetera, that make up you. Just like the hardness or the brownness of this table, these are words that we attach to certain underlying configurations of ordinary physical matter. Likewise, sadness and redness or whatever are words that we attach to you to describe what you're doing. And when it comes to consciousness in general, I'm very quick to say I do not claim to have any special insight on how consciousness works other than I see no reason to change the laws of physics to account for it. If you don't have to change the laws of physics, where do you think it emerges from? Is consciousness an illusion? It's almost like a shorthand that we humans use to describe a certain kind of feeling we have when interacting with the world. Or is there some big leap that happens? At some I stage. I almost never use the word illusion. Illusion means that there's something that you think you're perceiving that is actually not there. Like an oasis in the desert is an illusion. It has no causal efficacy. If you walk up to where the oasis is supposed to be, you'll say you were wrong about it being there. That's different than something being emergent or non-fundamental, but also real. Like this table is real, even though I know it's made of atoms. That doesn't remove the realness from the table. I think that consciousness and free will and things like that are just as real in tables and chairs. Oasis in the desert does have causal efficacy in that in your thirst causal efficacy. <laughs> well, you mean it leads you to draw incorrect conclusions about the world. Sure. But imagining a thing can sometimes bring it to reality, as we've seen, and that has a kind of a, a causal efficacy. 
Sure, but your understanding of the world in a way that gives you power over it and influence sure. over it is decreased rather than increased by believing in that oasis. That is not true about consciousness or this table. You don't think you can uh, increase the chance of a thing existing by imagining it, imagining it existing? <laughs> Unless you build it <laughs> or make it. No, that's what I mean. Like imagining humans can fly if you're that's the right different brothers. Imagine that humans are flying. <laughs> right. In terms of counterfactuals in the future, absolutely. Imagination is crucially important, but that's not an illusion. That's just a. Oh, okay. So it's a, the possibility of the future versus what reality is. I mean, the future is a concept, so you can uh, time. <laughs> time, time is just a concept, so you can play with that. But yes, reality. Um. So to you, so for, for example, <laughs> I have to <laughs> love asking this. So Donald Hoffman. Um thinks that the entirety of the conversation we've been having about space-time is an illusion. Is it possible for you to steel man the case for that? Can you make the case for and against reality, as I think uh, he writes, that uh, the laws of physics as we know them with space-time is a kind of interface to a much deeper thing that we don't at all understand, and that we're fooling ourselves by constructing this world? Well, I think there's like part of that idea that is perfectly respectable and part of it that is perfectly nonsensical. And I'm not even going to try to steel man the nonsensical part. The real part to me is, is what is called structural realism. So we don't know what the world is at a deep fundamental level, right? Let's put ourselves in the in the minds of people living 200 years ago. Like they, they didn't know about quantum mechanics. They didn't know about relativity. That doesn't mean they were wrong about the universe that they understood. They had Newton's laws, right? They could predict what time the sun was going to rise perfectly well. In the progress of science, the words that would be used to give the most fundamental description of how you were predicting the sun would rise changed because now you have curved space-time and things like that, right? And you didn't have any of those words 200 years ago. But the prediction is the same. Why? Because that prediction independent of what we thought the fundamental ontology was, the prediction pointed to something true about our understanding of reality. To call it an illusion is just wrong, I think. We might not know what the best, most comprehensive way of stating it is, but it's still true. Is it true in the way, for example, belief in God is true? Because for most of human history, people have believed in a god or multiple gods. And that seemed very true to them uh, as an explanation for the way the world is. Uh, some of the deeper questions about life itself and the human condition and why certain things happen, that was a good explainer. Um, so to you, that's not an illusion. No, I think that was completely an illusion. I think it was a very, very reasonable illusion to be under. There are illusions. There are, you know, substantive claims about the world that go beyond predictions that we can make and verify, uh, which later turned out to be wrong. And the existence of God was one of them. Um, if those people at that time had abandoned their belief in God and replaced it with a mechanistic universe, they would have done just as well <laughs> at understanding things, right? Uh, again, because there are so many things they didn't understand, it was very reasonable for them to have that belief. It wasn't that they were dummies or anything like that. But that is, you know, as we understand the universe better and better, some things stick with us, some things get replaced. 